Good evening, everybody. How you all doing? Y'all ready for some family night? How many people are no longer hungry? No longer hungry? If you're still hungry, the food's already done, but you should have ate. It was fantastic. So thank you to all those who helped out, prepared food, served, all that good stuff. Thank you so much. It was awesome. I know most of them are still probably back there, but if you see all those people that were back there and all those that helped cook, please thank them. But we're going to go ahead and get our, our family night kicked off. Tonight our testimony is going to be Brother Robert York. Can't wait to hear, hear about some of them coal mining stories and how mean he used to be. Oh, somebody said he still was. I, I think he's, I, I didn't say that. Debbie said otherwise. So it's, it's all good. We're all family here, so it's all good. But I, I really can't wait to, to get Robert up here a little bit later after we have some worship time. But we're going to go ahead and get into the offering. And it's family night, and with the theme of families, how many wants their family protected? Anybody want their family protected? Listen to, uh, I've been reading a lot of Psalms lately, but Psalms 91, 1 through 4 says this. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust Him. For He will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with His feathers. He will shelter you with His wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. His faithful promises. His promises are He will rebuke the devourer for a tither's sake. That's a great reason to tithe right there. Right there. Because we will be protected by His armor. I don't know anybody else that's got better armor but Him. So, whenever you sit down and think about tithing or, or contemplate tithing, look, I... I don't know about you, but there's times when I look at things and I'm like, oh no, it's time to tithe again. And, and then I look back and I'm like, you know what? He's protected my family so much, I can't not tithe. I can't not tithe. So when you think about that, when you think about that just look back at what he's done. And, and if you're not a tither yet, now is a perfect time to get started. 10% of your income and he will bless the rest of that 90% more than that 100% you had. So that's all I'm going to say about that. If you would, bring your tithe and your offerings forward. And then it's family night, so say hello to some of your family members that you hadn't seen in a couple days.
Okay, if everybody could head back to your seats, please. And if you could, as you get back to your seats, if, if you can, stand and we will go ahead and we will get this offering blessed. But it's already blessed because we've given it to God, but we're blessed anyway. All right, if everybody could, point your hands this way. Father, we love you this, tonight, and we just thank you for the opportunity to come into your house, and thank you for all you've done for us and all you're doing for us right now and all that you have planned for us, Lord. We just thank you for that, and we thank you that, for the money that's been collected here tonight, God. We ask that you would multiply it and do great and mighty things with it, Lord. Father, I pray for this praise team, God, as we go into a moment of worship, God, that that this sound, Father God, would be pleasing to your ears, Father God, that you would just hear something very, very sweet, Father God, that you would just, for just a little bit, be help us to, to just get into your presence and, and be lost in your presence, Lord. Father, I pray for, for Brother York as he gets up here, Father God, and gives his testimony, God, that you put the words in his mouth, Father God, that that he would be able to recall all the great and mighty things that you've done for him, Father God, and what he's but you have brought him through, Lord. And we just thank you for all the things that you do for us. We love you. We praise you in your wonderful name. Amen. All right, guys, just uh, for, for an announcement, uh, if you have the opportunity to get out and get some diapers and some water, we are collecting that here at the church out in the foyer. So um, going to Kentucky to help those people out, as you most of you know, they had a terrible, terrible flood, but anybody that is willing to donate some water or some diapers, bring it here to the church and we will get it to the right place. And with that being said, it is time to get into some worship. Come home, the helpless 
and doors swing wide. The dead come to life. And love is on the move when the father's in the room. Miracles take place. The cynical find faith. And love is breaking through when the father's in the room. Jericho walls are quaking. Strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, you're in the Father. to my mom's house I don't have to ask my mom if I can get a drink out of the refrigerator um, it's my mom's house I'm her, I'm her kid and, and if I need to go borrow a pair of socks I just go in my mom's bedroom and I just open her sock drawer and I just get out a pair of, a pair of socks because she's my mom and she's been my mom for my whole life but I feel like we should walk into, this is God's house. He's our father. And we should walk in here knowing that we can have whatever he says that we can have. <laughs> and we don't have to come in here worried about being real. Who knows us better than our father? There's nobody on this earth that knows you better than your father God. <laughs> Because he made you, he knows all the good and he knows all the bad, and yet he still wants us anyway. And it's kind of the same thing with, you know, with my earthly family. They know the worst things about me because they've seen the worst things. But yet they choose to love anyway. And it's the same thing with the Father. And I'm thankful that. When, when, we're, when we're able to walk into this place together, that we know that He's going to be here. We know that he, He's going to show up. He's going to be in this room with us tonight. And for me, there's no greater honor than, than to lead you all to worship the one who created the universe. He made the moon and He made the stars. And still he comes and he shows up in here with us. And I just want to, can we just take a couple of minutes right now? Let's just pray. Lord, help us to, to put our minds on you. It doesn't matter what's going on today. It doesn't matter the things that are on our plate for tomorrow. It doesn't matter the bills that are due. It doesn't matter the deficit in the bank account. It doesn't matter what's going on at home or what's going on with this person or what's going on with that person. But Lord, we're here tonight to spend our evening with you. And we ask that you help our minds, God, to line up with that, that our minds would be set on you tonight, that our hearts would be set on you tonight. Lord, that our worship, God, would line up with that as well, that we would be able to worship you and praise you without all that other stuff on our minds, God. 
we honor you tonight, Lord, and we thank you for all that you are. We praise you. Lord, we thank you. Just take a minute and just tell the Lord thank you for something. If you can't think of anything else to thank him for, thank him that you woke up today. Lord, we thank you for the breath that you've given us that's borrowed. We thank you that we've been given another day to be alive. We've been given another day to promote who you are, to build your kingdom, to grow your kingdom. We were given another chance, another opportunity to be in your presence tonight, Lord. Help all that other stuff to be put back behind us. You would be on the forefront. That our attention would be set on you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. When you walk into the room, everything changes. Darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring. When you walk into the room, every heart starts burning, and nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you. We worship you. to the room everything changes darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring when you walk into the room every heart starts burning and nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you. We worship you. Can't get enough. Oh. 
to so come and consume God all we are we give you permission our hearts are yours we want you oh we want you so come and consume God all we are we give you permission our hearts are yours we want you So come and consume God, all we are. We give you permission, our hearts are yours. We want you, oh, we want you. We love you, and we'll never stop. We can't live without you. in a hurry
This next song, we haven't done it in a while. I think it's been probably a couple of years. Um, and so we just learned it again on Monday. But I, I hope that you all will remember it and catch on really quick. Thank you, Jesus. Take this offering that I bring, humbly I fall on my knees to proclaim your everything. My life's nothing without you, take my hand and lead me through, you are my sustainer.
worship you forever. I'm gonna worship you. I'm gonna worship you forever. I'm gonna worship you. I'm gonna worship you forever. I'm gonna worship you. I'm gonna worship you forever. I'm gonna worship you. I'm gonna worship you forever. I'm gonna worship you. I'm gonna worship you forever. I'm gonna worship you. I'm gonna worship you forever. I'm gonna worship you. I'm gonna worship you forever. I'm gonna worship you. I'm gonna worship you forever. I'm gonna worship you. I'm gonna worship you forever. I'm gonna worship you. Worship you 
forever I'm gonna worship you days we're going to stand <laughs> where the streets are made out of gold and everything you faced here on this earth all the hardship and all the heartache it's going to be wiped away And we're going to get to worship him forever and ever. And we're not going to run out of reasons to worship him. We're not going to run out of energy to worship him. We're not going to run out of the strength to do it. And Lord, we want to thank you tonight, Lord, that we've been given the privilege, the privilege to stand in your presence to know that the words that we're singing you hear all of it <laughs> it doesn't go unnoticed but you hear it all you see all of it Lord and we thank you Jesus we thank you Jesus that one of these days we're going to get to see you face to face and we're going to know that every bit of what went on on this earth in our life was worth it to get to spend just a minute with you. <laughs> Thank you. Lord, I just ask that you just continue to move in this service, move in this place, move in us, God. We ask that your will would be accomplished tonight through Brother Robert. Lord, that you just anoint him, that you would just bring clarity to his mind, that you just be able to use him in a mighty way. Lord, as a, a, just as a tool in your mighty hands, God, that you use him tonight. That his testimony, <laughs> that it would be used to break off bondages off of other people in Jesus' name. And we thank you for all that you're going to do, all that you've already done tonight, but all that you will do. And we thank you for it in advance. In Jesus' name. Can somebody give the Lord some praise tonight? He deserves it. tonight. Hallelujah. I might have to throw me a Holy Ghost fit here in a minute. I count it a high privilege tonight I could say that the Lord has been good to me even when I was a sinner. As I look back in time, I thank God for praying people. I had a grandmother on my mother's side, which when I was growing up, my dad didn't get along with her too, too, too well because she was always witnessing to him. She was a Holy Ghost filled church of God, old time church of God. And I didn't know this when I was growing up because we didn't get to go around her that much. But I, I'm here tonight because of her prayers. 
I want to thank God that, we, that, I, that I know praying people, that I'm involved in a, a bunch of people here tonight, brothers and sisters in the Lord that knows how to pray. And I just want to give God all the praise and glory tonight that I'm able to stand up here, Brother R.C. Hallelujah. A time, I want to tell you, young people, time goes very, real fast. I look back in the year 1966. You say, my goodness. Well, the reason I'm bringing that up, see, God puts people in your life, and you don't even recognize at that time <laughs> that they can be a tremendous blessing to you. Well, there was a young, brown-eyed baby. Woo. Hallelujah. She just, I was a sophomore in high school, and she was a freshman. And she began to chase me around the halls. No, I'm just kidding. And, but I looked back at that and I said, and I began to realize that God put us together at a young age. I want to tell you something tonight, young people. God's going to put people in your life and you'll begin to recognize it. Come on. And you'll begin to see what a blessing they can be to you. And she was a great blessing to me back then. Oh, she helped me cheat. No, I'm just kidding. She helped take care of me. <laughs> well, I graduated in 1969, and she was still in high school. And we dated all those years. Her mama really loved me. No, she didn't really. And <laughs> I had a strange thing happen to me the other day. A guy asked me what my middle name was. I told him, I said, Lee. He said, my name, middle name's Robert. That brought a memory back to me when I was growing up at home. When my mother said, Robert Lee, I knew I was in trouble. How many have ever been there? And I haven't, heard the I haven't heard the Holy Ghost say that to me yet, so I must still be all right. Well, she finally proposed to me. <laughs> and we got married in 1969 in December. And we've been together ever since. It was Warren Roses. How many know what I'm talking about? Up to about nine years in 19 and in 78. There was a revival coming through the up in Pike County, Kentucky, where I'm originally from. I was born and raised in a place called Belfry, Kentucky. And God began to put, with a place I began to work, I became a I started as a coal miner in 1971, 72. I started out as a welder. I eventually became a supervisor. They called them chief electricians. I'd done that, and I moved over. I took that position at another coal mines, and, and that's where I, I started running into people that were starting to witness to me. They began to tell me about how much Jesus loves me. I want to tell you. place of Belfry and it kind of flooded in 1977 and the bottom of our mobile home got a uh, water, little water damage and I got insurance and they covered that. I had insurance on it but we wanted a piece of property that we could call our own. So the guy I work with, his wife, she was uh, always witnessing to me trying to get me to go to church and he said I know where you can find a piece of property. At that time, property was hard to come by in the coal fields because coal mines was really booming at that time. A lot of the old miners were retiring, and that allowed younger people to come into the field. And so I was one of them. He said, there's a piece of property right beside of me, but God, how many knows God will set you up? How many knows that? How many have ever been set up by the Holy Spirit? So the Holy Spirit was setting us up, and I didn't even realize. I was lost. I was like Jason. I was lost in a ball and tall weeds. I, was, I didn't have any really good sense at that time, but, you know, you thought you was living it up, you know. But God was setting us up. So we bought that piece of property, and we developed it and moved our mobile home over there. And uh, the guy I bought it off of was a free will Baptist pastor. And at that time, I kind of liked to uh, drink a little bit, you know, and, 
and they'd come over and visit, and I'd be sitting there, and I'd have to hide my, hide my beer and stuff. You know, I didn't want to. I mean, so they'd come over there, and, and they wanted to witness to me. I said, oh, no, here they come again. So his niece was lived beside of us, and she was there going to a revival down in Mate 1, West Virginia. And we lived in Kentucky, but uh, it's right on the border there. There's a Tug River that separates Kentucky and Tennessee and Mingo County there. And they were having a revival down in Mate 1, West Virginia. Well, she kept on to me, won't you go to church? We're having a revival, go to church. I said, if you quit smoking, that time she was a heavy smoker. I didn't smoke, and I, I never did because I tried it once, and I didn't, it didn't agree with me. I, I tried to chew in the back of that. Didn't, that didn't agree with me. So, <laughs> so she, she kept on to me. She said, okay. So we was coming over from her house, me and my oldest son at that time. He was about eight years old. And he started crying. He said, Daddy, I want to go to church. You know, God has strange ways of getting to you. Amen. So I said, son, if you want to go to church, we'll go to church. I didn't really realize what I was getting into, you know, because I'd never been in a Pentecostal church. It was Assembly of God Church. It was the first Assembly of God Church in Mate 1, West Virginia. And I didn't know, so we got ready, and we went that night. And I want to tell you something. When I walked into that church, I never felt the love of God like I feel here tonight again. Hallelujah. And I know there's something different. I wanted to sit in the back, way back in the back. How many have ever been there? You want, you, want, you want to sit way back in the back because I wanted to get out of that place as quick as possible. But then all that church is full except for the second row back. It was about half the size of this church, this sanctuary here. And about the second row back, I definitely didn't want to sit there. But that's the only place there was a sit, so my wife kept nudging me, so we had to go up and sit in the second row back. The, and there's enough seats for four of us. I had my two sons at that time. <laughs> and there's a, he was a preacher. He's a little guy. And that guy could preach. I'm telling you, look, he, he was, pastor, he would stick his leg. I can't lift my leg out. He'll, he'll, be, he'll be that high. As he was preaching, he'd jump and go back and forth. And I'm telling you what, he was anointed. I could feel the power of God. And he looked like he had a finger five foot long. Every time I looked up, it looked like it was pointing at me. Of course, it wouldn't. I just, you know, had the Holy Ghost. And, and I tell you what, I never heard such good singing, anointed singing that night. And something got a hold of me, and he's called the Holy Ghost. And he got begin to deal with me. And I got to thinking, I said, if he'll shut up, I'll go up and pray. <laughs> that means they know. So he made an altar call, and I went up, and, and he touched me. And listen, I didn't know anything about Pentecost. I didn't know anything about being slain in the Spirit. How many knows what I'm talking about tonight? If you've been slain in the Spirit, it's when the Holy Ghost will touch you and you lose. I mean, you just go out sometimes. So he touched me and I hit the floor. And my life has not been the same since the Holy Ghost touched me on a Sunday night in Mate 1, West Virginia, in 1978, I'm telling you, when the Lord touches you, you'll never, hallelujah, you'll never forget. Glory to God. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So God saved me on a Sunday night, and I was, like Brent said, I was pretty mean in the coal mines. Now, you work in a bunch of coal miners, it's pretty rough. And I didn't have too good a language. I had to learn to talk all over again. How many of you ever had to learn to talk all over again? Had to drop a few words. Yeah, I see a lot of heads go up, a lot of hands. So I had to learn how to talk all over again. And they, I went the next, I worked the evening shift. So I went the next day. They come in, they're carrying on a bunch of nonsense and a bunch of dirty stuff. And they said, ain't that right, York? I said, no. They all laughed. You know, they thought I was kidding. And I said, no, I'm serious. I don't do that stuff anymore. They said, what's the matter? I said, I got saved last night. The first question they asked me, how many knows what it was? Well, how do you know that you got saved? 
I said, well, I don't love to do the things I used to do. I don't want to drink anymore. I don't want to listen to that old country and western turjerk and move, uh, music anymore. Hallelujah. That's how I know that God saved me. I don't want to do the stuff I used to do. When you get saved, when you get born again, you're going to change. And I had a drastic change. Debbie said I went too far. I don't believe that. I don't believe you can go too far in the Holy Ghost. How many know what I'm talking about? Hallelujah. She said, I went overboard. I thought everybody wanted to be saved after I got saved. How many's been there? I thought everybody wanted to know about Jesus when I got saved. And I started telling everybody at work, and they kind of look at you, and they kind of, after a while, they kind of stayed away from you a little bit. But God began to move, and I began to get some teaching, and I began, just a few months later, Debbie got the baptism of the Holy Ghost first, and that made me mad. I said, how come she got it first and I didn't get it? So it was a couple months later before I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, God started dealing with me. I was working on the evening shift. He said, I want you to start a prayer after work where you're working. He said, there's a young man that you work with there. He said, he's redheaded. I didn't really know him that well. But he said, I want you to introduce yourself to him, and I want you and him to start praying after work. So I got with him that day, and I said, God has dealt, dealt with me to ask you, would you be willing to stay after work and begin to start praying for the vines that we work at? He said, yeah, I'll do that. He was a, he was a Holy Ghost-filled man, too. And uh, we got together, and we began to start praying. I'm telling you, you've got to pray. And I didn't know much about praying. All oh, the Lord baptized me in the Holy Ghost. I could pray in the Spirit, and I... I'm telling you what, we'd get out there and we'd be screaming. They thought, what in the world? We had a little building down below the rest of the people there. They said, what in the world's going on down there? And after a while, Brother R.C., <laughs> God began to move up on the side of that hill. I worked in the coal mines. We had two seams at that time, and there was about 60, 70, 80, maybe 70 some people that worked there. We had a a high seam, it was about 10 to 12 foot high, and then we had a low seam that was about this high. Maybe about that high. You couldn't hardly, you could, you could duck walk, and that's about it. I, I've got scars on my back <laughs> where they put the roof support in, and you, if you weren't very careful, you're going you're gonna to say some bad words most of the time when you hit the one of those roof posts. They kind of take the hide off your back. So you had to be real careful <laughs> about what you've done. But we started praying at night after work, and I always began to see after a little while, they was 30, I think, like, if I can remember correctly, there was 36 men at that mines that got saved. Hallelujah. I didn't know a lot of the word. All I knew, I was in love with Jesus, and I wanted to pray, and I wanted to see people get saved. So God moved in a mighty way. I'm going to move on to 2000. I got, I got jumping ears here. 2000, God began to deal with uh, my wife where our youngest son had moved down here to Maryville, Tennessee. And we'd come down when we'd visit, and we kind of liked the area where I'm from, the hilly the hollows that we lived in, you know, is if you wanted to go somewhere, it took you an hour to get there. If you wanted to go fishing, it took you two hours to go, to go fishing and back. So when we come down here, I began to see all the things that you could do down here. And I began, because I wanted to fish. Everybody knows that, praise God. But anyway, we started coming down here. We felt kind of, we really liked the area. And my wife, she got to liking it. And she was going home one day. She said, uh, when are you going to move to Tennessee? I said, well, when I retire. And she kept on to me, you know. And I said, well, I said, if you can sell the house, that was a mistake I made. <laughs> if, you, if you can sell the house, we'll move to Tennessee. I'd, I'd forgot about it, you know. I just, just told her that, you know, to get her off my back. <laughs> and one day she called me at work. I thought something was wrong. She said, I, I want to tell you something. I said, what? She said, I got good news for you. I said, good news? Well, that's great. She said, well, I sold the house. I about fell out of my chair. I said, Lord, what am I going to do now? So God, you know, God knows 
There's things that he knows our future and we don't. So it's all by faith. So, so I said, well, if you sold the house, that's what I told you. So I had to keep my word, you know what I'm saying. So we sold the house, and we went ahead, and, and she wanted to, we bought, come down here in, in the year 2000, and we bought a place where we live now. We've been there this past May 22 years. So we've been down here quite, this is home for us now. And praise God, I didn't think I'd ever leave the, the hills of Kentucky. But uh, God had other plans. How many knows God always moves in time frames? How many notice through every, about every 10 years things begin to happen? How many never notice that? Your life begins to change. So we moved down here and bought a place out there where we live now, out on Friendsville, on Big Spring Ridge. Summers Oak Subdivision, most of them have probably been there. And we moved there, and we found, I know, I had to find a church to go to. How many knows? you got us. I, I had a, the first pastor I had, he always preached, Pastor Dale, to be faithful and pay your tithes. I heard that about every service. <laughs> so I learned pretty, pretty quickly he expected me to be there, and he expected me to pay tithes. So I learned that pretty quickly. But when I first got saved, I didn't know what tithes was. How many knew what tithes was when you first got saved? Most people don't know that. I didn't know that. And I was walking into coal mines. I'll go back to the tithes here in just a minute. The tithing is a spiritual thing. How many knows that? It's a spiritual thing. God is a legal God, and he does everything legal. How many knows that? He cannot go outside of his word. He's got to stay in the guidelines of his word. He kept dealing with me, and I was walking, Brother R.C., in the coal mines, and I said I was arguing with God. How many ever argued with God? How many knows you're not going to win? You're not going to win. So I said, okay, Lord, I'll pay those tithes, whatever they are. So I began to pay tithes, and I didn't know then within two years I'd be out of a job. How many knows God knows what's going to happen tomorrow when we don't? That God wants to take care of us no matter what condition you're in right now. You don't know what tomorrow holds, but I tell you, God does, and he's going to take care of you and me. So I didn't know what in a couple of years I was out of a job, but I had another miracle. I was paying tithes. I was being faithful to the Lord, and we was having revival. My goodness, they was, I don't know how many hundreds of people back in the 70s were getting saved. And and God, we, we got faithful. We got uh, joined the First Assembly. God had made one in West Virginia. And we stayed there, what, 18 years? 18 years. And Debbie taught in a Christian school for, I don't know, 14, 10, or 12 years, something like that. I was one of the, I was an adult Sunday school teacher for years. I was on the board. They called the board then, you know. I was doing that. But God eventually moved us to another Assembly of God church called Bethel Temple. And everywhere God moved us, how many knows God will move you at certain times to, do, to change things and be a blessing to other people? And God moved us to another church. And just a little while after that, I began, I began a, I was associate pastor. There was, two, uh, there was three of us. There was two associate pastors and the main pastor. And also, I, it got me teaching adult Sunday school class again. See, that, leaves, that seems to follow me everywhere I go. <laughs> So we uh, started doing that, and we was there probably about 10, 8 to 10 years. A great, great bunch of people. When we left there, they, they, they took an offering up for us, and they'd really throw the dinner, and, you know. When you leave churches right, come on now, you've got to leave right. Because you made, if you join a church, you make a commitment to the, and you're supposed to be loyal to that commitment. How many knows what I'm talking about? So I had enough sense. I knew the teaching that I had, I had to leave. When you leave a place, you have to leave right. You have to go and talk to the pastor and, you know, and leave in a loving spirit. So if I wanted to go back, I could go back. Amen? How many knows what I'm talking about? So we left and we come down here. But I... We bought the house. They'd be moved down here, but I was still working in West Virginia. So what I was doing, I was traveling back and forth, and I'd done that, what, three years, wasn't it? But I knew the company I was working for, it was beginning to work out. And they was wanting to move me up into West Virginia to another coal mines, and I said, no, I'm going south. I'm not going north. I'm going south. 
So I come down here. I got laid off. I didn't have no job. How many knows? I know somebody's been here, been about out of job. And I had a house payment, and had car payments, and all these payments, and I was out of a job. But God, everybody say, but God. He'll always take care of you. I don't care what it looks like. Debbie was all tore up. She was putting, when are you going to get a job? I said, well, she was putting pressure. How many knows what I'm talking about? These women know how to put pressure on a man. Come on. Amen. They know how to put pressure on you. Does every day, when are you going to get a job? I said, I don't know much about this area. You know, I'm just, just moved down here. <laughs> so what happened, I ended up buying a lawn care business. Now, here a coal miner, now let's get this picture now. A coal miner buys a lawn care business, and I didn't have much grass to cut where I come from, but I thought I knew how. Amen. Let me know what I'm talking about. But I had a, a learning experience real quick, and I'd done that for three years so I learned better. What was, I got allergies real bad, and I had to get, I had to sell the business to get out of it because I was having a lot of allergies and sinus infections and stuff like that. So I had to get out of it. But during that time, one day on Merchants Drive up in North Knoxville, we was coming back from cutting a, a few yards there, and we come out on the highway there, and this car come around this kind of in a, kind of in a curve, and we was coming real slow. And a car hit us, knocked the front axle out underneath my truck, knocked both axles out underneath the trailer we was pulling behind it, flipped one of my lawnmowers over on the, on the hard top, and praise God, but God, I felt a little pain. go back to cutting grass tomorrow and I said I called a guy I knew I said you got a trailer I can borrow I got another truck so praise God he said yeah if you can get it out of the garage over there, you can go get it so I got my son and we got that trailer I went back to where they had at Fountain City and got my equipment and I went back to cutting grass the next day so that's what God will do for you when you're paying I, matter of fact I come out better with a better truck than what I had, a newer trailer than what I had, and better equipment when it's all over because the insurance had to pay for all that. And I give God the praise and glory. When you get to looking back, what God has, will do for you, you stay faithful, committed, and dedicated, and keep believing God day in and day out, and pay your tithes and be faithful. God will always, I don't care what happens, God will always take care of you. Hallelujah. Now I'm moving to 2012. In 2012, you know, I'd retired. And, you know, I thought I was just retiring so I could fish. Well, at that time, I thought, you know, man, I'm going to have a good time, which I did. I, we bought a place, had a camper up on Cherokee Lake, and I got to go and, and fish, and Debbie had to work. Had a pretty good deal going there. Amen. Debbie, <laughs> Debbie was still working. And uh, so I got to enjoy a little bit of that. But what happened, I got a phone call one day. And said, he said, Dad, he said, I got some bad news. I said, what is it, son? He said, I've got a rare type of cancer. It's called ALL. I don't know the proper. It's a, a type of blood cancer, leukemia. He said, there's only two types of people get this. He said, use the younger people and the older people. And he was middle. He was still in his in his. He was 42 years old. And I said, Lord, we started, you know, heavy broke down, and I started crying. And he said, oh, we're fighters. His wife was a fourth-generation Pentecostal. He married into a great Christian family, a real supportive family. And we got to pray, and we was going to uh, Central at that time, Central, uh, Central, real Central. And But we got all people, thank God again, come on now, Thank God again for people that are praying with you and believe God. And we had people all over the country praying for us and praying for him. The miracle was they couldn't believe that he had it. He was, in the, he was a medic. He's a respiratory, a respiratory tech. 
uh, in a children's hospital in uh, Little Rock on an angel flight. He was on a helicopter. He, he went to get critical children in, uh, for the hospital. So they couldn't believe he had cancer, but he has a, a doctor said, well, I can get you into MD Anderson Hospital, and I know there's a doctor down there, and they'll, they'll take you right on in if you want to go down there. So that's one of the best cancer hospitals in the country, MD Anderson Hospital in Houston, Texas. So he got an appointment, goes down there, and they said, well, you've got a 36 to 40% chance of survival. He said, if we can get a, a donor, a, trans, a stem cell transplant, he said, you might, it, it might take a couple years to do that. So the prognosis wasn't too encouraging at that time. But, everybody say, but God. Ooh, hallelujah. He done planned all this out long before it ever happened. Right. Yeah. Right. What she said, it was going to take a year for him to go into remission by chemo treatments. The first chemo treatment, he went into remission. Hallelujah. I mean, man, what a mighty God that we serve tonight. And he went in remission. They said, well, if we can find a donor, a stem cell transplant donor, he might, he'll have a chance of survival. But that'd probably take two years. <laughs> Everybody say, but God, he had other plans. Praise God. I said, well, what about me or my wife? They said, well, you you're too old. I said, well, he, they said, do you have a, 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 a son? I said, no, son. I said, yes. He said, well, he might be a possibility, but I doubt it. Everybody say, but God had a different plan. He already knew what was coming, but we didn't. So they said, well, we can test him and see if he's a match, but we doubt it. So listen to this. My son was in construction work. He was a painter. He was a professional painter, and he worked for a guy that done work in Houston, Texas. Now, listen to this. And he would send him down there occasionally to do work in Houston, Texas. Now, you tell me, God, <laughs> I'm telling you, God is wonderful. He's mighty. He's almighty. He's a good God. Everybody say he's a good God. He worked it out. Now, listen to this, that my son was down there the, the week that they wanted to do those stem cell shots. He had to take shots in his stomach to drive the stem cells in his blood. So he was down there that week, so he didn't have to make a special trip. He was down there. I was down there. That's why I got, I got to retire, because my son had to have a, a caretaker, somebody take care of him while he was there, because his wife had to work. Debbie was working. So God made it possible where I could go down and help him, because he had to be taken to the hospital every day. And he had to have a place to stay. So I got the opportunity to be down there. So God worked it for my youngest son to be down there so he could be tested. And they took, he took those shots. And they said, well, we've got to have so many stem cells to do the transplant. We've got to have, and after they, I was in a the room. They was taking blood out of this arm and putting it back in this arm. It was running it through a machine. And it was, a, it was something else to see. And he was sitting there, and they, after the, all that happened, they said, well, he said, we got three times more than what we need. <laughs> Hallelujah. So God worked that out. Now he said, well, we got to find out if he's a match. And they was kind of doubting it. So they run all the tests and all this stuff, and it come back that he was 99.9, .9, a perfect match for my son. Hallelujah. You tell me God is not good? If he'll do it for me, he'll do it for anybody. Amen? Praise God. But to finish this up, I thank God for a, a great church here at Rio East. I thank God for Pastor Dale and Sister Teresa and of all the leadership here. Because I can see, I know, I've been here long enough to know the heart that the people have here. Really want to see people get saved. And I want to read a scripture before I sit down. 
I've enjoyed this. I, I felt the presence of the Holy Ghost here tonight. I thank God that I have the opportunity. I want to read this scripture if I can get my phone to cooperate. Praise God. Technology. In 2 Timothy, One and eight. Now I back up and read one and seven. I love this scripture. How many knows what it says? For God, this is the amplified version. It says, For God did not give us a spirit of Timothy or a cowardice or a craving or clinging to false fears. But he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of calm and well balanced mind and discipline and self control. Do not blush or be ashamed then to testify to or for our Lord, nor me, a prisoner for his sake. But with me, take your share of suffering to which the preaching of the gospel may, ex may expose you and do it in the power of God. And everybody said, Hallelujah. That's all I got, brother. I'm not going to send anybody home without an opportunity. If you have felt touched or you need anything from God and you've heard all the things that just Brother Robert and Debbie have been through, that God has worked miracles in, and we could go around the room and just say all the great things he's done, but if you need something right now, if you need one of those miracles, if you need some help praying for something, if you need Jesus, if you don't have a relationship with him, you, this is your opportunity to come to the altar. So if anybody has anything that you want to do, Jason, if you'll play a little bit of music for us. Uh, if you have anything you want to pray about, it doesn't matter what it is, please come up here. This altar is, is for you guys. Jesus, Jesus wants to touch you and heal you.